Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 466, Labor. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. It is the beginning of Labor Day weekend, and I hope you are having a wonderful time. I am still recording in advance because I am fairly certain that I am not going to have hit the ground running this week. It's always hard to recover from international trips and and come back into a non-routine routine. So I thought I should probably get a grip and jumpstart this sucker. So this week we are going to listen to, for Oz listeners, 40 chapters. No, not really. We are, however, going to listen to four chapters. 100, 101, 102, and 103. That is The Apparition. Locusta, Valentine, and Maximilian. That lets you know why we are listening to all four of these chapters all today. Yes, it'll be long, but yes, it will be very satisfying-ish by the end. At least we'll know where we stand with one of our subsets of victims, I guess you have to say, from uh, victims of the Count Ney Edmund's wrath. And... That's all I'm going to say about that, because if I say any more, I will give everything away. So let's not do that right now. Let's listen instead to our four chapters, 100, 101, 102, and 103 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 100. The Apparition. As the procureur had told Madame Donglar. Valentine was not yet recovered. Bowed down with fatigue, she was indeed confined to her bed, and it was in her own room and from the lips of Madame de Villefort that she heard all the strange events we have related. We mean the flight of Eugenie and the arrest of Andrea Cavalcanti, or rather Benedetto, together with the accusation of murder pronounced against him. But Valentine was so weak that this recital scarcely produced the same effect it would have done had she been in her usual state of health. Indeed, her brain was only the seat of vague ideas and confused forms, mingled with strange fancies, alone presented themselves before her eyes. During the daytime, Valentine's perceptions remained tolerably clear, owing to the constant presence of Monsieur Noirtier, who caused himself to be carried to his granddaughter's room, and watched her with his paternal tenderness. Villefort also, on his return from the law courts, frequently passed an hour or two with his father and child. At six o'clock, Villefort retired to his study. At eight, Monsieur d'Avrigny himself arrived, bringing the night draft prepared for the young girl, and then Monsieur Noirtier was carried away. A nurse of the doctor's choice succeeded them, and never left till about ten or eleven o'clock, when Valentine was asleep. As she went downstairs, she gave the keys of Valentine's room to Monsieur de Villefort, so that no one could reach the sick room excepting through that of Madame de Villefort and little Edward. Every morning Morel called on Noirtier to receive news of Valentine, and, extraordinary as it seemed, each day found him less uneasy. Certainly, though Valentine still laboured under dreadful nervous excitement, she was better, and, moreover, Monte Cristo had told him when, half distracted, he had rushed to the Count's house, that if she were not dead in two hours, she would be saved. Now four days had elapsed, and Valentine still lived. The nervous excitement of which we speak pursued Valentine even in her sleep, or rather in that state of somnolence which succeeded her waking hours. It was then, in the silence of night, in the dim light shed from the alabaster lamp on the chimney-piece, that she saw the shadows pass and repass which hover over the bed of sickness, 
and fanned the fever with their trembling wings. First she fancied she saw her stepmother threatening her. Then Morel stretched his arms towards her. Sometimes mere strangers like the Count of Monte Cristo came to visit her. Even the very furniture, in these moments of delirium, seemed to move. And this state lasted till about three o'clock in the morning, when a deep, heavy slumber overcame the young girl, from which she did not awake till daylight. On the evening of the day on which Valentine had learned of the flight of Eugenie and the arrest of Benedetto, Villefort, having retired as well as Noirtier and Davrigny, her thoughts wandered in a confused maze, alternately reviewing her own situation and the events she had just heard. Eleven o'clock had struck. The nurse, having placed the beverage prepared by the doctor within reach of the patient, and locked the door, was listening with terror to the comments of the servants in the kitchen, and storing her memory with all the horrible stories which had for some months past amused the occupants of the antechambers in the house of the king's attorney. Meanwhile an unexpected scene was passing in the room which had been so carefully locked. Ten minutes had elapsed since the nurse had left. Valentine, who for the last hour had been suffering from the fever which returned nightly, incapable of controlling her ideas, was forced to yield to the excitement which exhausted itself in producing and reproducing a succession and recurrence of the same fancies and images. The night lamp threw out countless rays, each resolving itself into some strange form to her disordered imagination, when suddenly by its flickering light Valentine thought she saw the door of her library, which was in the recess by the chimney-piece, open slowly though she in vain listened for the sound of the hinges on which it turned. At any other time, Valentine would have seized the silken bell-pull and summoned assistance, but nothing astonished her in her present situation. Her reason told her that all the visions she beheld were but the children of her imagination, and the conviction was strengthened by the fact that in the morning no traces remained of the nocturnal phantoms who disappeared with the coming of daylight. From behind the door a human figure appeared, but the girl was too familiar with such apparitions to be alarmed, and therefore only stared, hoping to recognize Morel. The figure advanced toward the bed, and appeared to listen with profound attention. At this moment a ray of light glanced across the face of the midnight visitor. "'It is not he,' she murmured, and waited, in the assurance that this was but a dream." for the man to disappear or assume some other form. Still, she felt her pulse, and finding it throb violently, she remembered that the best method of dispelling such illusions was to drink, for a draught of the beverage prepared by the doctor to allay her fever seemed to cause a reaction of the brain, and for a short time she suffered less. Valentine, therefore, reached her hand towards the glass, but as soon as her trembling arm left the bed, the apparition advanced more quickly towards her, and approached the young girl so closely that she fancied she heard his breath and felt the pressure of his hand. This time the illusion, or rather the reality, surpassed anything Valentine had before experienced. She began to believe herself really alive and awake, and the belief that her reason was this time not deceived made her shudder. The pressure she felt was evidently intended to arrest her arm, and she slowly withdrew it. Then the figure, from whom she could not detach her eyes, and who appeared more protecting than menacing, took the glass, and walking towards the night-light, held it up, as if to test its transparency. This did not seem sufficient. The man, or rather the ghost, for he trod so softly that no sound was heard, then poured out about a spoonful into the glass, and drank it. Valentine witnessed this scene with a sentiment of stupefaction. Every minute she had expected that it would vanish and give place to another vision. But the man, instead of dissolving like a shadow, again approached her and said in an agitated voice, "'Now you may drink.' Valentine shuddered. It was the first time one of these visions had ever addressed her in a living voice, and she was about to utter an exclamation. The man placed his finger on her lips." "'The Count of Monte Cristo,' she murmured. 
it was easy to see that no doubt now remained in the young girl's mind as to the reality of the scene her eyes started with terror her hands trembled and she rapidly drew the bedclothes closer to her still the presence of monte cristo at such an hour his mysterious fanciful and extraordinary entrance into her room through the wall might well seem impossibilities to her shattered reason do not call any one do not be alarmed said the count do not let a shade of suspicion or uneasiness remain in your breast the man standing before you valentine for this time it is no ghost is nothing more than the tenderest father and the most respectful friend you could dream of valentine could not reply the voice which indicated the real presence of a being in the room alarmed her so much that she feared to utter a syllable still the expression of her eyes seemed to inquire if your intentions are pure why are you here the count's marvellous sagacity understood all that was passing in the young girl's mind listen to me he said or rather look upon me look at my face paler even than usual and my eyes red with weariness for four days i have not closed them for i have been constantly watching you to protect and preserve you for maximilian the blood mounted rapidly to the cheeks of valentine for the name just announced by the count dispelled all the fear with which his presence had inspired her maximilian she exclaimed and so sweet did the sound appear to her that she repeated it maximilian has he then owned all to you everything he told me your life was his and i have promised him that you shall live you have promised him that i shall live yes but sir you spoke of vigilance and protection are you a doctor yes the best you can have at the present time believe me but you say you have watched said valentine uneasily where have you been i have not seen you the count extended his hand towards the library i was hidden behind that door he said which leads into the next house which i have rented valentine turned her eyes away and with an indignant expression of pride and modest fear exclaimed sir i think you have been guilty of an unparalleled intrusion and that what you call protection is more like an insult valentine he answered during my long watch over you all i have observed has been what people visited you what nourishment was prepared and what beverage was served then when the latter appeared dangerous to me i entered as i have now done and substituted in the place of the poison a healthful draught which instead of producing the death intended caused life to circulate in your veins poison death exclaimed valentine half believing herself under the influence of some feverish hallucination what are you saying sir hush my child said monte cristo again placing his finger upon her lips i did say poison and death but drink some of this and the count took a bottle from his pocket containing a red liquid of which he poured a few drops into the glass drink this and then take nothing more to-night valentine stretched out her hand but scarcely had she touched the glass when she drew back in fear monte cristo took the glass drank half its contents and then presented it to valentine who smiled and swallowed the rest oh yes she exclaimed i recognize the flavor of my nocturnal beverage which refreshed me so much and seemed to ease my aching brain thank you sir thank you this is how you have lived during the last four nights valentine said the count but oh how i passed at that time oh the wretched hours i have endured the torture to which i have submitted when i saw the deadly poison poured into your glass and how i trembled lest you should drink it before i could find time to throw it away sir said valentine at the height of her terror you say you endured tortures when you saw the deadly poison poured into my glass but if you saw this you must also have seen the person who poured it yes valentine raised herself in bed 
and drew over her chest which appeared whiter than snow the embroidered cambric still moist with the cold dews of delirium to which were now added those of terror you saw the person repeated the young girl yes repeated the count what you tell me is horrible sir you wish to make me believe something too dreadful what attempt to murder me in my father's house in my room on my bed of sickness oh leave me sir you are tempting me you make me doubt the goodness of providence it is impossible it cannot be are you the first that this hand has stricken have you not seen monsieur de saint meron madame de saint meron barois all fall would not monsieur noirtier also have fallen victim had not the treatment he has been pursuing for the last three years neutralized the effects of the poison oh heaven said valentine is this the reason my grandpapa has made me share all his beverages during the last month and have they all tasted of a slightly bitter flavour like that of dried orange peel oh yes yes then that explains all said monte cristo your grandfather knows then that a poisoner lives here perhaps he even suspects the person he has been fortifying you his beloved child against the fatal effects of the poison which has failed because your system was already impregnated with it but even this would have availed little against a more deadly medium of death employed four days ago which is generally but too fatal but who then is this assassin this murderer let me also ask you a question have you never seen any one enter into your room at night oh yes i have frequently seen shadows pass close to me approach and disappear but i took them for visions raised by my feverish imagination and indeed when you entered i thought i was under the influence of delirium then you do not know who it is that attempts your life no said valentine who could desire my death you shall know it now then said monte cristo listening how do you mean said valentine looking anxiously around because you are not feverish or delirious to-night but thoroughly awake midnight is striking which is the hour murderers choose oh heavens exclaimed valentine wiping off the drops which ran down her forehead midnight struck slowly and sadly every hour seemed to strike with leaden weight upon the heart of the poor girl valentine said the count summon up all your courage still the beatings of your heart do not let a sound escape you and feign to be asleep then you will see valentine seized the count's hand i think i hear a noise she said leave me good-bye for the present replied the count walking upon tiptoe towards the library door and smiling with an expression so sad and paternal that the young girl's heart was filled with gratitude before closing the door he turned around once more and said not a movement not a word let them think you are asleep or perhaps you may be killed before i have the power of helping you and with this fearful injunction the count disappeared through the door which noiselessly closed after him end of chapter 100 chapter 101 locusta valentine was alone two other clocks slower than that of saint philippe du roule struck the hour of midnight from different directions and excepting the rumbling of a few carriages all was silent then valentine's attention was engrossed by the clock in her room which marked the seconds she began counting them remarking that they were much slower than the beatings of her heart and still she doubted the inoffensive valentine could not imagine that any one should desire her death why should they to what end what had she done to excite the malice of an enemy there was no fear of her falling asleep one terrible idea pressed upon her mind that some one existed in the world who had attempted to assassinate her and who was about to endeavour to do so again 
supposing this person wearied at the inefficacy of the poison should as monte cristo intimated have recourse to steel what if the count should have no time to run to her rescue what if her last moments were approaching and she should never again see morel when this terrible chain of ideas presented itself valentine was nearly persuaded to ring the bell and call for help but through the door she fancied she saw the luminous eye of the count that eye which lived in her memory and the recollection overwhelmed her with so much shame that she asked herself whether any amount of gratitude could ever repay his adventurous and devoted friendship twenty minutes twenty tedious minutes passed thus then ten more and at last the clock struck the half hour just then the sound of fingernails slightly grating against the door of the library informed valentine that the count was still watching and recommended her to do the same at the same time on the opposite side that is towards edward's room valentine fancied that she heard the creaking of the floor she listened attentively holding her breath till she was nearly suffocated the lock turned and the door slowly opened valentine had raised herself upon her elbow and had scarcely time to throw herself down on the bed and shade her eyes with her arm then trembling agitated and her heart beating with indescribable terror she awaited the event someone approached the bed and drew back the curtains valentine summoned every effort and breathed with that regular respiration which announces tranquil sleep valentine said a low voice still silent valentine had promised not to awake then everything was still excepting that valentine heard the almost noiseless sound of some liquid being poured into the glass she had just emptied then she ventured to open her eyelids and glance over her extended arm she saw a woman in a white dressing-gown pouring a liquor from a phial into her glass during this short time valentine must have held her breath or moved in some slight degree for the woman disturbed stopped and leaned over the bed in order the better to ascertain whether valentine slept it was madame de villefort on recognizing her stepmother valentine could not repress a shudder which caused a vibration in the bed madame de villefort instantly stepped back close to the wall and there shaded by the bed curtains she silently and attentively watched the slightest movement of valentine the latter recollected the terrible caution of monte cristo she fancied that the hand not holding the file clasped a long sharp knife then collecting all her remaining strength she forced herself to close her eyes but this simple operation upon the most delicate organs of our frame generally so easy to accomplish became almost impossible at this moment so much did curiosity struggle to retain the eyelid open and learn the truth madame de villefort however reassured by the silence which was alone disturbed by the regular breathing of valentine again extended her hand and half hidden by the curtains succeeded in emptying the contents of the phial into the glass then she retired so gently that valentine did not know she had left the room she only witnessed the withdrawal of the arm the fair round arm of a woman but twenty-five years old and who yet spread death around her it is impossible to describe the sensations experienced by valentine during the minute and a half madame de villefort remained in the room the grating against the library door aroused the young girl from the stupor in which she was plunged and which almost amounted to insensibility she raised her head with an effort the noiseless door again turned on its hinges and the count of monte cristo reappeared well said he do you still doubt oh murmured the young girl have you seen alas did you recognize valentine groaned oh yes she said i saw but i cannot believe would you rather die then and cause maximilian's death oh repeated the young girl almost bewildered can i not leave the house can i not escape valentine the hand which now threatens you will pursue you everywhere 
your servants will be seduced with gold and death will be offered to you disguised in every shape you will find it in the water you drink from the spring in the fruit you pluck from the tree but did you not say that my kind grandfather's precaution had neutralized the poison yes but not against a strong dose the poison will be changed and the quantity increased he took the glass and raised it to his lips it is already done he said brucine is no longer employed but a simple narcotic i can recognize the flavor of the alcohol in which it has been dissolved if you had taken what madame de villefort has poured into your glass valentine valentine you would have been doomed but exclaimed the young girl why am i thus pursued why are you so kind so good so unsuspicious of ill that you cannot understand valentine no i have never injured her but you are rich valentine you have two hundred thousand livres a year and you prevent her son from enjoying those two hundred thousand livres how so the fortune is not her gift but is inherited from my relations certainly and that is why monsieur and madame de saint meron have died that is why monsieur noirtier was sentenced the day he made you his heir that is why you in your turn are to die it is because your father would inherit your property and your brother his only son succeed to his edward poor child are all these crimes committed on his account ah then you at length understand heaven grant that this may not be visited upon him valentine you are an angel but why is my grandfather allowed to live it was considered that you dead the fortune would naturally revert to your brother unless he were disinherited and besides the crime appearing useless it would be folly to commit it and is it possible that this frightful combination of crimes has been invented by a woman do you recollect in the arbor of the hotel de poste at perugia seeing a man in a brown cloak whom your stepmother was questioning upon aqua tofana well ever since then the infernal project has been ripening in her brain ah then indeed sir said the sweet girl bathed in tears i see that i am condemned to die no valentine for i have foreseen all their plots no your enemy is conquered since we know her and you will live valentine live to be happy yourself and to confer happiness upon a noble heart but to ensure this you must rely on me command me sir what am i to do you must blindly take what i give you alas were it only for my own sake i should prefer to die you must not confide in any one not even in your father my father is not engaged in this fearful plot is he sir asked valentine clasping her hands no and yet your father a man accustomed to judicial accusations ought to have known that all these deaths have not happened naturally it is he who should have watched over you he should have occupied my place he should have emptied that glass he should have risen against the assassin spectre against spectre he murmured in a low voice as he concluded his sentence sir said valentine i will do all i can to live for there are two beings whose existence depends on mine my grandfather and maximilian i will watch over them as i have over you well sir do as you will with me and then she added in a low voice oh heavens what will befall me whatever may happen valentine do not be alarmed though you suffer though you lose sight hearing consciousness fear nothing though you should awake and be ignorant where you are still do not fear even though you should find yourself in a sepulchral vault or coffin reassure yourself then and say to yourself at this moment a friend a father who lives for my happiness and that of maximilian 
watches over me alas alas what a fearful extremity valentine would you rather denounce your stepmother i would rather die a hundred times oh yes die no you will not die but will you promise me whatever happens that you will not complain but hope i will think of maximilian you are my own darling child valentine i alone can save you and i will valentine in the extremity of her terror joined her hands for she felt that the moment had arrived to ask for courage and began to pray and while uttering little more than incoherent words she forgot that her white shoulders had no other covering than her long hair and that the pulsations of her heart could be seen through the lace of her nightdress monte cristo gently laid his hand on the young girl's arm drew the velvet coverlet close to her throat and said with a paternal smile my child believe in my devotion to you as you believe in the goodness of providence and the love of maximilian then he drew from his waistcoat pocket the little emerald box raised the golden lid and took from it a pastille about the size of a pea which he placed in her hand she took it and looked attentively on the count there was an expression on the face of her intrepid protector which commanded her veneration she evidently interrogated him by her look yes said he valentine carried the pastille to her mouth and swallowed it and now my dear child adieu for the present i will try and gain a little sleep for you are saved go said valentine whatever happens i promise you not to fear monte cristo for some time kept his eyes fixed on the young girl who gradually fell asleep yielding to the effects of the narcotic the count had given her then he took the glass emptied three parts of the contents in the fireplace that it might be supposed valentine had taken it and replaced it on the table then he disappeared after throwing a farewell glance on valentine who slept with the confidence and innocence of an angel End of chapter 101 Chapter 102 Valentine The nightlight continued to burn on the chimney-piece, exhausting the last drops of oil which floated on the surface of the water. The globe of the lamp appeared of a reddish hue, and the flame, brightening before it expired, threw out the last flickerings which an inanimate object have been so often compared with the convulsions of a human creature in its final agonies a dull and dismal light was shed over the bedclothes and curtains surrounding the young girl all noise in the streets had ceased and the silence was frightful it was then that the door of edward's room opened and a head we have before noticed appeared in the glass opposite it was madame de villefort who came to witness the effects of the drink she had prepared she stopped in the doorway listened for a moment to the flickering of the lamp the only sound in that deserted room and then advanced to the table to see if valentine's glass was empty it was still about a quarter full as we before stated madame de villefort emptied the contents into the ashes which she disturbed that they might the more readily absorb the liquid then she carefully rinsed the glass and wiping it with her handkerchief replaced it on the table if any one could have looked into the room just then he would have noticed the hesitation with which madame de villefort approached the bed and looked fixedly on valentine the dim light the profound silence and the gloomy thoughts inspired by the hour and still more by her own conscience all combined to produce a sensation of fear the prisoner was terrified at the contemplation of her own work at length she rallied drew aside the curtain and leaning over the pillow gazed intently on valentine the young girl no longer breathed no breath issued through the half-closed teeth the white lips no longer quivered the eyes were suffused with a bluish vapor and the long black lashes rested on a cheek white as wax madame de villefort gazed upon the face so expressive even in its stillness then she ventured to raise the coverlet and press her hand upon the young girl's heart 
it was cold and motionless she only felt the pulsation in her own fingers and withdrew her hand with a shudder one arm was hanging out of the bed from shoulder to elbow it was moulded after the arms of germain pilon's graces but the forearm seemed to be slightly distorted by convulsion and the hand so delicately formed was resting with stiff outstretched fingers on the framework of the bed the nails too were turning blue madame de villefort had no longer any doubt all was over she had consummated the last terrible work she had to accomplish there was no more to do in the room so the poisoner retired stealthily as though fearing to hear the sound of her own footsteps but as she withdrew she still held aside the curtain absorbed in the irresistible attraction always exerted by the picture of death so long as it is merely mysterious and does not excite disgust just then the lamp again flickered the noise startled madame de villefort who shuddered and dropped the curtain immediately afterwards the light expired and the room was plunged in frightful obscurity while the clock at that minute struck half past four overpowered with agitation the poisoner succeeded in groping her way to the door and reached her room in an agony of fear the darkness lasted two hours longer then by degrees a cold light crept through the venetian blinds until at length it revealed the objects in the room about this time the nurse's cough was heard on the stairs and the woman entered the room with a cup in her hand to the tender eye of a father or a lover the first glance would have sufficed to reveal valentine's condition but to this hireling valentine only appeared to sleep good she exclaimed approaching the table she has taken part of her draught the glass is three-quarters empty then she went to the fireplace and lit the fire and although she had just left her bed she could not resist the temptation offered by valentine's sleep so she threw herself into an armchair to snatch a little more rest the clock striking eight awoke her astonished at the prolonged slumber of the patient and frightened to see that the arm was still hanging out of the bed she advanced towards valentine and for the first time noticed the white lips she tried to replace the arm but it moved with a frightful rigidity which could not deceive a sick nurse she screamed aloud then running to the door exclaimed help help what is the matter asked monsieur d'avrigny at the foot of the stairs it being the hour he usually visited her what is it asked villefort rushing from his room doctor do you hear them call for help yes yes let us hasten up it was in valentine's room but before the doctor and the father could reach the room the servants who were on the same floor had entered and seeing valentine pale and motionless on her bed they lifted up their hands towards heaven and stood transfixed as though struck by lightning call madame de villefort wake madame de villefort cried the procureur from the door of his chamber which apparently he scarcely dared to leave but instead of obeying him the servant stood watching monsieur d'avrigny who ran to valentine and raised her in his arms what this one too he exclaimed oh where will be the end villefort rushed into the room what are you saying doctor he exclaimed raising his hands to heaven i say that valentine is dead replied d'avrigny in a voice terrible in its solemn calm monsieur de villefort staggered and buried his head in the bed on the exclamation of the doctor and the cry of the father the servants all fled with muttered imprecations they were heard running down the stairs and through the long passages then there was a rush in the court afterwards all was still they had one and all deserted the accursed house just then madame de villefort in the act of slipping on her dressing gown threw aside the drapery and for a moment stood motionless as though interrogating the occupants of the room while she endeavoured to call up some rebellious tears on a sudden she stepped or rather bounded with outstretched arms towards the table she saw d'avrigny curiously examining the glass which she felt certain of having emptied during the night it was now a third full just as it was when she threw the contents into the ashes the spectre of valentine rising before the poisoner would have alarmed her less 
It was indeed the same colour as the draught she had poured into the glass, and which Valentine had drunk. It was indeed the poison which could not deceive M. d'Avrigny, which he now examined so closely. It was doubtless a miracle from heaven, that notwithstanding her precautions there should be some trace, some proof remaining to reveal the crime. While Madame de Villefort remained rooted to the spot like a statue of terror, and Villefort, with his head hidden in the bedclothes, saw nothing around him, d'Avrigny approached the window that he might better examine the contents of the glass, and dipping the tip of his finger in, tasted it. Ah! he exclaimed, it is no longer brucine that is used. Let me see what it is. Then he ran to one of the cupboards in Valentine's room, which had been transformed into a medicine closet, and taking from its silver case a small bottle of nitric acid, dropped a little of it into the liquor, which immediately changed to a blood-red colour. Ah! exclaimed d'Avrigny, in a voice in which the horror of a judge unveiling the truth was mingled with the delight of a student making a discovery. Madame de Villefort was overpowered. Her eyes first flashed and then swam. She staggered towards the door and disappeared. Directly afterwards the distant sound of a heavy weight falling on the ground was heard, but no one paid any attention to it. The nurse was engaged in watching the chemical analysis, and Villefort was still absorbed in grief. M. d'Avrigny alone had followed Madame de Villefort with his eyes and watched her hurried retreat. He lifted up the drapery over the entrance to Edward's room, and his eye reaching as far as Madame de Villefort's apartment. He beheld her, extended lifeless on the floor. "'Go to the assistance of Madame de Villefort,' he said to the nurse. "'Madame de Villefort is ill.' "'But Mademoiselle de Villefort,' stammered the nurse. "'Mademoiselle de Villefort no longer requires help,' said d'Avrigny, "'since she is dead.' "'Dead! Dead!' groaned forth Villefort, in a paroxysm of grief, which was the more terrible from the novelty of the sensation in the iron heart of that man. "'Dead?' repeated a third voice. "'Who said Valentine was dead?' The two men turned round, and saw Morel standing at the door, pale and terror-stricken. This is what had happened. At the usual time, Morel had presented himself at the little door leading to Noirtier's room. Contrary to custom, the door was open, and having no occasion to ring, he entered. He waited for a moment in the hall and called for a servant to conduct him to Monsieur Noirtier, but no one answered, the servants having, as we know, deserted the house. Morel had no particular reason for uneasiness. Monte Cristo had promised him that Valentine should live, and so far he had always fulfilled his word. Every night the Count had given him news which was the next morning confirmed by Noirtier. Still, this extraordinary silence appeared strange to him, and he called a second and third time. Still no answer. Then he determined to go up. Noirtier's room was opened like all the rest. The first thing he saw was the old man sitting in his armchair in his usual place. But his eyes expressed alarm, which was confirmed by the pallor which overspread his features. "'How are you, sir?' asked Morel, with a sickness of heart. "'Well,' answered the old man by closing his eyes, but his appearance manifested increasing uneasiness. "'You are thoughtful, sir,' continued Morel. "'You want something. Shall I call one of the servants?' "'Yes,' replied Noirtier. Morel pulled the bell, but though he nearly broke the cord, no one answered. He turned towards Noirtier, the pallor and anguish expressed on his countenance momentarily increased. "'Oh!' exclaimed Morel. "'Why do they not come? Is anyone ill in the house?' The eyes of Noirtier seemed as though they would start from their sockets. "'What is the matter? You alarm me! Valentine! Valentine!' "'Yes! Yes!' signed Noirtier. Maximilien tried to speak but he could articulate nothing. He staggered and supported himself against the wainscot. Then he pointed to the door. "'Yes, yes, yes,' continued the old man. 
Maximilien rushed up the little staircase, while Noirtier's eyes seemed to say, "'Quicker, quicker!' In a minute the young man darted through several rooms, till at length he reached Valentine's. There was no occasion to push the door. It was wide open. A sob was the only sound he heard. He saw, as though in a mist, a black figure kneeling and buried in a confused mass of white drapery. A terrible fear transfixed him. It was then he heard a voice exclaim, "'Valentine is dead!' And another voice, which like an echo repeated, "'Dead! Dead!' End of chapter 102 Chapter 103 Maximilien. Villefort rose, half ashamed of being surprised in such a paroxysm of grief. The terrible office he had held for twenty-five years had succeeded in making him more or less than man. His glance, at first wandering, fixed itself upon Morel. "'Who are you, sir?' he asked. "'That forget that this is not the manner to enter a house stricken with death. Go, sir, go!' But Morel remained motionless. He could not detach his eyes from that disordered bed and the pale corpse of the young girl who was lying on it. "'Go! Do you hear?' said Villefort, while Davrigny advanced to lead Morel out. Maximilien stared for a moment at the corpse, gazed all round the room, then upon the two men. He opened his mouth to speak but finding it impossible to give utterance to the innumerable ideas that occupied his brain, he went out, thrusting his hands through his hair, in such a manner that Villefort and Davrigny, for a moment diverted from the engrossing topic, exchanged glances which seemed to say, "'He is mad!' But in less than five minutes the staircase groaned beneath an extraordinary weight. Morel was seen carrying, with superhuman strength, the armchair containing Noirtier upstairs. When he reached the landing, he placed the armchair on the floor and rapidly rolled it into Valentine's room. This could only have been accomplished by means of unnatural strength supplied by powerful excitement. But the most fearful spectacle was Noirtier being pushed towards the bed, his face expressing all his meaning and his eyes supplying the want of every other faculty. That pale face and flaming glance appeared to Villefort like a frightful apparition. Each time he had been brought into contact with his father, something terrible had happened. "'See what they have done!' cried Morel, with one hand leaning on the back of the chair, and the other extended towards Valentine. "'See, my father, see!' Villefort drew back, and looked with astonishment on the young man, who, almost a stranger to him, called Noirtier his father. At this moment the whole soul of the old man seemed centred in his eyes which became bloodshot. The veins of the throat swelled, his cheeks and temples became purple, as though he was struck with epilepsy. Nothing was wanting to complete this but the utterance of a cry, and the cry issued from his pores, if we may thus speak, a cry frightful in its silence. D'Avrigny rushed towards the old man and made him inhale a powerful restorative. "'Sir,' cried Morel, seizing the moist hand of the paralytic, "'they ask me who I am, and what right I have to be here. "'Oh, you know it! Tell them! Tell them!' And the young man's voice was choked by sobs. As for the old man, his chest heaved with his panting respiration. One could have thought that he was undergoing the agonies preceding death. At length— Happier than the young man, who sobbed without weeping, tears glistened in the eyes of Noirtier. "'Tell them,' said Morel, in a hoarse voice, "'tell them that I am her betrothed. Tell them she was my beloved, my noble girl, my only blessing in the world. Tell them, oh, tell them that corpse belongs to me.' The young man, overwhelmed by the weight of his anguish, fell heavily on his knees before the bed, which his fingers grasped with convulsive energy. D'Avrigny, unable to bear the sight of this touching emotion, turned away, and Villefort, without seeking any further explanation, 
and attracted towards him by the irresistible magnetism which draws us towards those who have loved the people for whom we mourn, extended his hand towards the young man. But Morel saw nothing. He had grasped the hand of Valentine, and, unable to weep, vented his agony in groans as he bit the sheets. For some time nothing was heard in that chamber but sobs, exclamations, and prayers. At length Villefort, the most composed of all, spoke. "'Sir,' said he to Maximilien, "'you say you loved Valentine, that you were betrothed to her. I knew nothing of this engagement of this love, yet I, her father, forgive you, for I see that your grief is real and deep, and besides my own sorrow it is too great for anger to find a place in my heart. But you see that the angel whom you hoped for has left this earth. She has nothing more to do with the adoration of men. Take a last farewell, sir, of her sad remains. Take the hand you expected to possess once more within your own, and then separate yourself from her forever. Valentine now requires only the ministrations of the priest. "'You are mistaken, sir,' exclaimed Morel, raising himself on one knee his heart pierced by a more acute pang than any he had yet felt. "'You are mistaken. Valentine, dying as she has, not only requires a priest, but an avenger. You, Monsieur de Villefort, send for the priest. I will be the avenger.' "'What do you mean, sir?' asked Villefort, trembling at the new idea inspired by the delirium of Morel. "'I tell you, sir, that two persons exist in you, the father has mourned sufficiently. Now let the procureur fulfil his office. The eyes of Noirtier glistened, and Avrigny approached. Gentlemen, said Morel, reading all that passed through the minds of the witnesses to the scene, I know what I am saying, and you know as well as I do what I am about to say. Valentine has been assassinated. Villefort hung his head. D'Avrigny approached nearer, and Noirtier said yes with his eyes. "'Now, sir,' continued Morel, "'in these days no one can disappear by violent means "'without some inquiries being made as to the cause of her disappearance. "'Even were she not a young, beautiful and adorable creature like Valentine, "'Monsieur Procureur,' said Morel with increasing vehemence, "'no mercy is allowed.' I denounce the crime. It is your place to seek the assassin. The young man's implacable eyes interrogated Villefort, who on his side glanced from Noirtier to Darigny, but instead of finding sympathy in the eyes of the doctor and his father, he only saw an expression as inflexible as that of Maximilian. Yes, indicated the old man. Assuredly, said Darigny. Sir, said Villefort, striving to struggle against this triple force and his own emotion. "'Sir, you are deceived. No one commits crimes here. I am stricken by fate. It is horrible indeed, but no one assassinates.' The eyes of Noirtier lighted up with rage, and Davrigny prepared to speak. Morel, however, extended his arm and commanded silence. "'And I say that murders are committed here.' said Morel, whose voice, though lower in tone, lost none of its terrible distinctness. "'I tell you that this is the fourth victim within the last four months. I tell you Valentine's life was attempted by poison four days ago, though she escaped, owing to the precautions of Monsieur Noirtier. I tell you that the dose has been double, the poison changed, and that this time it has succeeded.' I tell you that you know these things as well as I do, since this gentleman has forewarned you, both as doctor and as a friend. "'Oh, you rave, sir!' exclaimed Villefort, in vain endeavouring to escape the net in which he was taken. "'I rave?' said Morel. "'Well, then, I appeal to Monsieur Davrigny himself. Ask him, sir, if he recollects the words he uttered in the garden of this house on the night of Madame de saint Méran's death.' You thought yourselves alone, and talked about that tragical death. 
"'And the fatality you mentioned, then, is the same which has caused the murder of Valentine.' Villefort and Davrigny exchanged looks. "'Yes, yes,' continued Morel. "'Recall the scene, for the words you thought were only given to silence and solitude fell into my ears. Certainly, after witnessing the culpable indolence manifested by Monsieur de Villefort towards his own relations, I ought to have denounced him to the authorities. Then I should not have been an accomplice to thy death, as I now am. Sweet, beloved Valentine, but the accomplice shall become the avenger. This false murder is apparent to all, and if thy father abandon thee, Valentine, it is I, and I swear it, that shall pursue the assassin. And this time, as though nature had at least taken compassion on the vigorous frame, nearly bursting with its own strength, the words of Morel were stifled in his throat, his breast heaved, the tears so long rebellious gushed from his eyes, and he threw himself weeping on his knees by the side of the bed. Then Davrigny spoke, and I too, he exclaimed in a low voice, I unite with Monsieur Morel in demanding justice for crime. My blood boils at the idea of having encouraged a murderer by my cowardly concession. Oh, merciful heavens! murmured Villefort. Morel raised his head, and reading the eyes of the old man which gleamed with unnatural lustre. Stay, he said. Monsieur Noirtier wishes to speak. Yes, indicated Noirtier with an expression the more terrible from all his faculties being centred in his glance. Do you know the assassin? asked Morel. Yes, replied Noirtier. And will you direct us? exclaimed the young man. Listen, Monsieur d'Avrigny, listen. Noirtier looked upon Morel with one of those melancholy smiles which had so often made Valentine happy, and thus fixed his attention. Then, having riveted the eyes of his interlocutor on his own, he glanced towards the door. "'Do you wish me to leave?' said Morel, sadly. "'Yes,' replied Noirtier. "'Alas! Alas, sir! Have pity on me!' The old man's eyes remained fixed on the door. "'May I at least return?' asked Morel. "'Yes.' "'Must I leave alone?' "'No. Whom am I to take with me? The procureur?' "'No. The doctor?' "'Yes.' "'You wish to remain alone with Monsieur de Villefort?' "'Yes.' "'But can he understand you?' "'Yes.' "'Oh,' said Villefort, inexpressibly delighted to think that the inquiries were to be made by him alone. "'Oh, be satisfied.' I can understand my father. D'Avrigny took the young man's arm and led him out of the room. A more than death-like silence then reigned in the house. At the end of a quarter of an hour, a faltering footstep was heard, and Villefort appeared at the door of the apartment where D'Avrigny and Morel had been staying, one absorbed in meditation, the other in grief. "'You can come,' he said, and led them back to Noirtier. Morel looked attentively on Villefort. His face was livid, large drops rolled down his face, and in his fingers he held the fragments of a quill pen which he had torn to atoms. "'Gentlemen,' he said in a hoarse voice, "'give me your word of honour that this horrible secret shall forever remain buried amongst ourselves.' The two men drew back. "'I entreat you,' continued Villefort. "'But,' said Morel, the culprit, the murderer, the assassin. Do not alarm yourself, sir. Justice will be done, said Villefort. My father has revealed the culprit's name. My father thirsts for revenge as much as you do, yet even he conjures you as I do to keep this secret. Do you not, father? Yes, resolutely replied Noirtier. Morel suffered an exclamation of horror and surprise to escape him. "'Oh, sir,' said Villefort, arresting Maximilien by the arm, "'if my father 
the inflexible man makes this request it is because he knows be assured that valentine will be terribly revenged is it not so father the old man made a sign in the affirmative villefort continued he knows me and i have pledged my word to him rest assured gentlemen that within three days in a less time than justice would demand the revenge i shall have taken for the murder of my child will be such as to make the boldest heart tremble and as he spoke these words he ground his teeth and grasped the old man's senseless hand will this promise be fulfilled monsieur noirtier asked morel while d'avrigny looked inquiringly yes replied noirtier with an expression of sinister joy swear then said villefort joining the hands of morel and d'avrigny swear that you will spare the honor of my house and leave me to avenge my child d'avrigny turned round and uttered a very feeble yes but morel disengaging his hand rushed to the bed and after having pressed the cold lips of valentine with his own hurriedly left uttering a long deep groan of despair and anguish we have before stated that all the servants had fled monsieur de villefort was therefore obliged to request monsieur d'avrigny to superintend all the arrangements consequent upon a death in a large city more especially a death under such suspicious circumstances it was something terrible to witness the silent agony the mute despair of noirtier whose tears silently rolled down his cheeks villefort retired to his study and d'avrigny left to summon the doctor of the mayoralty whose office it is to examine bodies after decease and who is expressly named the doctor of the dead monsieur noirtier could not be persuaded to quit his grandchild at the end of a quarter of an hour monsieur d'avrigny returned with his associate they found the outer gate closed and not a servant remaining in the house villefort himself was obliged to open to them but he stopped on the landing he had not the courage to again visit the death chamber the two doctors therefore entered the room alone noirtier was near the bed pale motionless and silent as the corpse the district doctor approached with the indifference of a man accustomed to spend half his time amongst the dead he then lifted the sheet which was placed over the face and just unclosed the lips alas said d'avrigny she is indeed dead poor child yes answered the doctor laconically dropping the sheet he had raised noirtier uttered a kind of hoarse rattling sound the old man's eyes sparkled and the good doctor understood that he wished to behold his child he therefore approached the bed and while his companion was dipping the fingers with which he had touched the lips of the corpse in chloride of lime he uncovered the calm and pale face which looked like that of a sleeping angel a tear which appeared in the old man's eye expressed his thanks to the doctor the doctor of the dead then laid his permit on the corner of the table and having fulfilled his duty was conducted out by d'avrigny villefort met them at the door of his study having in a few words thanked the district doctor he turned to d'avrigny and said and now the priest is there any particular priest you wish to pray with valentine asked d'avrigny no said villefort fetch the nearest the nearest said the district doctor is a good italian abbe who lives next door to you shall i call on him as i pass d'avrigny said villefort be so kind i beseech you as to accompany this gentleman here is the key of the door so that you can go in and out as you please you will bring the priest with you and will oblige me by introducing him into my child's room do you wish to see him i only wish to be alone you will excuse me will you not a priest can understand a father's grief and m de villefort giving the key to d'avrigny again bade farewell to the strange doctor and retired to his study where he began to work for some temperaments work is a remedy for all afflictions as the doctors entered the street 
they saw a man in a cassock standing on the threshold of the next door. "'This is the abbé of whom I spoke,' said the doctor to Davrigny. Davrigny accosted the priest. "'Sir,' he said, "'are you disposed to confer a great obligation to an unhappy father who has just lost his daughter? I mean Monsieur de Villefort, the king's attorney.' "'Ah,' said the priest in a marked Italian accent, "'yes, I have heard that death is in that house. "'Then I need not tell you what kind of service he requires of you.' "'I was about to offer myself, sir,' said the priest. "'It is our mission to forestall our duties.' "'It is a young girl.' "'I know it, sir. "'The servants who fled from the house informed me. "'I also know that her name is Valentine, "'and I have already prayed for her.' "'Thank you, sir.' said d'Avrigny, since you have commenced your sacred office, deign to continue it. Come and watch by the dead, and all the wretched family will be grateful to you. I am going, sir, and I do not hesitate to say that no prayers will be more fervent than mine. D'Avrigny took the priest's hand, and without meeting Villefort, who was engaged in his study, they reached Valentine's room, which on the following night was to be occupied by the undertakers. On entering the room, Noirtier's eyes met those of the abbé, and no doubt he read some particular expression in them, for he remained in the room. D'Avrigny recommended the attention of the priest to the living as well as to the dead, and the abbé promised to devote his prayers to Valentine and his attentions to Noirtier. In order, doubtless, that he might not be disturbed while fulfilling his sacred mission, the priest rose as soon as d'Avrigny departed, and not only bolted the door through which the doctor had just left, but also that leading to Madame de Villefort's room. End of chapter 103 All right, then. So we have a little Romeo and Juliet action happening here. The Let Me Give You Something Oh, and did I tell you that it's going to make you completely look like you're dead to everybody else? But, but the Count wouldn't lie to Maximilian, right? But it's still very stressful because Valentine's lips were turning blue, or her, her lips were white, her fingernail beds were turning blue, whatever it was he gave her. It was pretty hardcore. And am, am I wrong in thinking that it was the little hashish or opium box that he, he took something out of the little pastille? At first I thought, oh, well, he's just going to knock her out. But n no, it seems to have done a little bit more than that. And the, the breakdown of the family, everyone, the breakdown of the household following the announcement of Valentine's apparent demise was awful. For one thing, all of the servants wisely got out of Dodge, so good on them. But all of the different reactions, the ones that really got to me, the doctor was very sad. But of course, it's Noitier and Maximilian, who really just broke my heart. And the Count's going to have some answering to do. I don't see how he's going to get Valentine out of there. I mean, obviously he has shown up as his Abbe self, and that's great. He can keep an eye on things, but it seems kind of complicated to get her out of there if she's not actually dead. And that's a little stressful. <sighs> I did think, however, that even though we are at the very end of the book, I mean, really, we are chapters, very few, away from the end now, uh, I thought it was interesting that we're still learning some things at this late date. One, I didn't remember, if we learned it before, I certainly had forgotten, that Madame Villefort is 25 years old. I mean, woof. So, Edward is eight? She's a little baby when she had him. So the whole conflict between her and Valentine, the conflict that isn't a conflict, I and mean, she doesn't seem to be particularly mean or nasty to Valentine. She's not the evil stepmother kind of stereotype that's being played on here. We know now for certain that she was doing very horrible things to Valentine behind the scenes. But to her face, she didn't seem to be the wicked stepmother at all. But all of that just becomes unnerving in the hands of a 25-year-old. In, in the hands of somebody older, somehow all of it would sit better with me, but she's just so young. 
And I think this came up one other time, way a long time ago in the book, Locusta, which is the name of chapter 101, is the name of the woman who was the notorious poison maker back in Rome, back forever ago, in like 54 AD, she got busted. So that would have been the giveaway if I had reminded you that Locusta was the poisoner from ancient times. That would have given away too much, I think. So were you surprised? Were you horrified to find out that it was Madame de Vivor? Or was that just kind of, it had gotten obvious to you? I can't remember now if I was surprised or not. I think I might have been surprised to find it confirmed, but I had my suspicions prior to that. Either way, though, sad, sad state of affairs, because clearly V4 knows now for certain what's going on, and so does Noitier. And soon the little tiny tight knit group of family members that have circled the wagons, they will all know if they don't already. I also thought that Valentine's really innocent response to, holy smoke, it's my stepmom? You know, she just couldn't, she couldn't wrap her head around it. And my initial reaction to female characters like that is always to roll my eyes. And I think in this book especially, that is a really unfair position for me to take. Specifically because in the beginning of the book, I think Edmund was exactly the same. Remember, even, even by the time he, he met Abbe Faria, he was like, but I don't understand. Why would these guys have done that to me? It was all just a mistake. Oh, no, no. People did this to you on purpose. But why? Why would they do it to me on purpose? And as Ken filled me in spectacularly, and excellent timing on that point, Ken, no, actually, the things that looked so petty are absolutely the kinds of things that could have ticked Dunglar off enough to orchestrate the imprisonment and the who cares what happens after meant of Edmond Dantes. And Dantes was absolutely incapable of grasping that, at least for a while. And then he came to terms with it. <laughs> and then he got revenge. I, I don't get the sense that Valentine is really going to go off on a revenge binge if she has an opportunity to at some point, if she is still alive. But I was very forgiving, I think, in many ways of Dantes's innocence when it came to understanding human nature. And my instinct was not to be as generous with Valentine. And I think that's bad on me. I'm going to own that one. That said, my older son found a series on YouTube on a channel called Charisma on Command, which I know sounds kind of cheeseball. But this guy does some really interesting videos on professional and sometimes not so professional interactions with people. It's kind of a how to be a good guy channel, but it's not it's not really aimed at guys, just just guys. And I say that because he has several really, really interesting videos on the Game of Thrones. And one of them is on why Tyrion will always win. Now, after this last season, I don't know if he still feels that that is accurate, but he goes through the first couple of seasons and pinpoints where Tyrion is doing things actively to not just save himself, but put himself in a position where he can be of service to others as well as himself. And it's just really fascinating to watch the breakdown of these things. He has another one on why the Starks will always be betrayed. And I watched it thinking, wow, if I had known any of that in high school, I would have had such an easier time, but I didn't. Now I do. And that helps. But yeah, so I'm going to own my my Valentine and Dante's little prejudices there. Well, Valentine and her penultimate drama here, before we come to the end of the book, that took up the bulk of our episode today. But there is one thing I wanted to go back to. When I landed in Germany, the last time that I had access to solid internet service was at the Frankfurt airport. And I got an email from listener Sarah, longtime listener, and she was understandably upset by me being happy about the way things were left with Eugenie and Luis Darmely. And that's because Dumas was being really subtle at the end of their chapter at the Bell and Bottle when Cavalcante gets nabbed and they leave. Uh, both of us went back and reread that section 
several times, actually, because it is pretty minimalist on his part. But Sarah had thought that the two women did not escape, that the the crowd that was whispering about them and kind of making fun of them trapped them there and that they didn't get out. And that would have been horrible and horrifying. And I think it would have gone against everything that I've come to think I understand about Alexandre Dumas, being the, the outsider himself, and also the way that he he has described Eugenie as this beautiful woman who is an excellent judge of beauty in others, particularly women. Men, she's able to appreciate good bone structure. But aside from that, her whole comment about the Count of Monte Cristo, who everybody else says is so devastating and handsome, she said, wow, he's really pale. The end. So Dumas does a lot of really graduate thesis level work on how he characterized, especially Eugenie, but also Louise Darmali, as little as we see of her in the book. She is an interesting character as well. However, in in trying to come to terms with my misunderstanding of the, the end of the chapter and Sarah's response, and then eventually coming back together and going, oh, we get it. Okay. I found several really interesting web pages that were discussions, not necessarily essays, although I did find one that was really very nice that was an essay, but discussions amongst people, just normal people who love books. And it was really interesting to read, and I am linking out to these from the show notes so that you can read them too. It was really interesting to read specifically because the people's responses to Eugenie and whether she prefers women to men in friendship, in love, in lifetime commitment, in sexuality, in in anything. They were all over the map. There are people who would have sworn on a stack of Bibles that she ran away because she was independent and wanted to be free and wanted to be an artist and didn't want to be tied down by love. There were those who were furious because Dumas had played to a stereotype of a butch woman who loves other women and is getting out of Dodge because nobody understands her. It ran the entire gambit. And unlike other times, when I've gone online and read conversations between people who fundamentally disagree over issues, this one didn't get my blood pressure up. Instead, I guess I I kind of was sitting back and just looking at how many people were able to take exactly the same piece of text and cite it for very, very different conclusions. Is just amazing. And so if you're at all interested, I recommend you follow some of these links. I've labeled them in the in the show notes so you can decide if you want to read the essay or the conversations or one or the other. Fascinating. Fascinating to watch it happen in in front of your eyes, as it were. My only comment at this point, n- now being confirmed, Sarah and I agree that they did in fact get out of there and they have a happy ending. It may very well be the only people who have a happy ending. We can't tell at this point, but at least they got away from the dangerous, crazy people. There's another thing that I think goes along with the four chapters for today that link up with Eugenie. We have Mercedes who starts out as a young woman, and she is strong, and she is really smart, obviously, and beautiful and talented and a quick study and all of that. But by the time we get to this part of the book, she is no longer the ingenue. The two real women who we have to compare against each other, are Valentine and Eugenie. They are, of course, both beautiful and have excellent manners and have been raised to be the young ladies that they are out in public. They go to the right places. They do the right things. All of that. They, they get arranged marriages like they're supposed to. But the thing that I think is so beautiful about what Dumas has done is that the only difference apparently, between them is how they play their desire for independence. Valentine is a little less proactive, which didn't surprise me, but her her desire to be allowed to love who she wants to love and not be pushed into anything is absolutely the same as Eugenie's. Eugenie wants to be with a woman. Valentine wants to be with uh, Maximilien. And that's the end of it. Eugenie's strength appears to other people as being, and he said this several times during the course of the book, as being masculine, 
but she herself is not masculine in her in her looks in her speech in her dress the difference is in how she goes after what she wants and her her last scene with her father at the end of chapter 98 i think so when she when she basically says here's how the marriage contract is going to go dad here's what we're going to do here's how we're going to do it here's what i'm doing and then i'm done got it that last section is beautiful and worth worth the time to go back and listen or i can link out to it from the show notes as well but duma duma has tracked her in such an interesting way all of the characters i mean we know that this was written as a serial novel which means that all of the characters had to have some kind of outline that was done at the beginning i would imagine I don't know how you could pull a book like this off without that. But Eugenie's arc is is one of those interesting ones that's been flying under the radar for most of the book. And yet she turns out to be the character who I'd really like to go and have a beer with her. And maybe it's because we don't know tons about her. But God, I think she'd be really, really interesting because she's been watching everyone. And she's obviously very smart and probably a little judgy and... That would be fun. She's the Dorothy Parker of this book. And I love that. I'd be terrified that she would be, you know, aiming her ire at me, just like I would with actual Dorothy Parker. But but that's okay, too. It's good to have a challenge. All right. We received several voicemails while I was on the road. And I am having Justin play them for you now. And those will play us out of today's episode. And we'll be back next week with our next couple of chapters for The Count of Monte Cristo. All went well in Germany, except for me not having access to any kind of internet. And as a consequence, I am now finally starting to edit and upload photographs so you can see some of the cool things that I found while I was in Germany. Those are going out on Instagram, which then goes to Twitter and then to Facebook. I did one brief 3G. I had 3G service. I was on the top of a hill where the restaurant was, and I was able to do one brief bit on Facebook Live, and that was it. That was the last time I had any service at all. So, very frustrating. But, beautiful country, love the Audubon, wish Americans could drive like Germans, but as one of the teachers pointed out, the German Audubon roads are in excellent shape, so you can go really, 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 really fast without risking your neck. It would be a little dicier on our roads right now here in the States. So, so yeah, Audubon is awesome. And that's it. Take care of yourself. I'll talk to you soon. Here are the voicemails we've received. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Hey, Heather, it's Lee Wilson, Knitting Rose. I'm calling because I've heard people say that they think that um, Mercedes knows what, knows about uh, the Count, that he's Edmond or suspects it. I don't think she does know. I think her heart knows, but she consciously does not know. She just knows that this is someone inherently that she should be able to trust and that she should be able to care for. I also don't think that that he would ever do the actual dirty deeds of putting notices in papers or things like that. He will orchestrate those deeds to be done because people should pay for the past, for the things that they have done. But I don't think that he will actually he would actually be the man to fulfill any of those those retributions because he's not that kind of guy. He lets he lets he lets others and God take care of that vindictiveness um, that he feels and that he wants to do. But he's really he he gives everybody lots of chances. He gives them chances to to redeem themselves and and try to do better, and they always fail. And by failing, they're hurting themselves. He doesn't do it. They actually do it. I don't know. Um, Anyway, I just, this Mercedes thing has been bothering me for a while. I don't think she knows. I think her heart does, though. Talk to you later. I'm loving the book. Can't wait for the end. This is fabulous. Bye. Hi, Heather. This is Ken from Honolulu. A few chapters back, the Count of Monte Cristo changed, sort of was changing his mind about who Heide was to him. He stopped looking at her as a daughter and maybe as a lover. Some people might see that as creepy and kind of weird, especially with as old as he was and as young as she was when they first came in contact with each other. But if you go back a few more chapters beyond that, Heidi almost said that she stopped looking at him 
as a father figure and looked at him as something more than that, as almost a lover. And also, when he went in for, when he was going for the duel, that was not the response of a daughter. That would be more the response of a lover. So, just some little interesting tidbits there about him and his relationship with Heide, how it's changing. Thank you for reading, or thank you for having all of this. Aloha. Hi, Heather. This is Jocelyn in Portland. I have been listening to the podcast since I think the beginning, this is my first time calling in and I had to call in because I just finished listening to chapter 98 and wanted to say, Heather, I really want to talk about the end of chapter 98. I really want to know what Dumas thought his readers at the time would think of Eugenie and her actions. I think today she reads as haughty, yes, but independent and adventurous. But I wonder if um, in Dumas' day, all of the things that make her super appealing and interesting and unique for that time period to me were supposed to all be indicators of you know somebody you were not supposed to like. I was really impressed that uh, and surprised that Dumas took that character as far as he did. I thought that was pretty interesting. So thanks so much for doing the Count of Monte Cristo. I've been really enjoying it and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the whole thing ends. Thanks a lot. Bye. Oh my goodness, Heather, I just remember the procureur doesn't actually know Benedetta slash Cavalcanti is his son. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.